talk all ancient creatures, great and small, Greco and Roman, a new book by UVM classics professor teaches readers how to care about animals. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Jolay Whitney. According to a recent study by Forbes advisor, 66% of U.S. households own a pet. That's 86.9 million homes. The study found that that percentage of pet owners has spiked over the last three decades. Dogs and cats top the list of most owned pets, with fish a distant third. But the report is mum on snails, wolves, octopi, and elephants, all animals which show up in one work or another in the works of our guest today. Mark D. Usher is a UVM classics professor, a self-described hardscrabble farmer, and the author of Pocket-Sized Guides of Ancient Wisdom for Princeton Press, How to Be a Farmer, An Ancient Guide to Life on the Land, and How to Say No, An Ancient Guide to the Art of Cynicism. Welcome back across the fence, Mark. Thank you. It's great to be here. So you've talked about farming and, of course, cynicism, as we just mentioned. What made you decide to foray into animals? Well, in both farming and cynicism, animals play a large role. Farming, it's obvious, you've got your domesticated livestock. Uh, I'm a farmer, so we raise those, but also the wild critters that uh, inhabit farms as well, like coyotes and fisher cats and raccoons and whatever else. So the farming piece already had animals in it, uh, and the cynicism piece also has animals, because the cynics always made an appeal um, to living according to nature, um, and they used animals as kind of like a, a sounding board for maybe how we should human animals behave in the world. So they're always appealing to the behavior of animals as not so much a model, but like a uh, like a, a standard. Um, you know, animals living within their means, humans should live within their means. So uh, it just uh, was a natural segue to you know, having a volume about animals themselves. Sure, the common denominator there. Exactly. And you write in your introduction that animals are all the rage these days, but also that people have become more and more distant from nature. Do you mm. think those are inherently contradictory? Actually, I think they're related to one another. You mentioned pets at the, uh, in the outtake at the beginning of the show, and pets are sort of a symptom of our alienation from nature. Uh, not necessarily a bad one, but because we have become more distanced from living close to uh, the natural world, animals included, um, we compensate for that um, by having them around us as pets. Zoos is another kind of, or another kind of uh, reflex of that, of that phenomenon. So, uh, you know, uh, people who have pets are probably yearning to be closer to nature and they're doing what they can to do that. And you just mentioned zoos and we've already spoken a little bit about pets, but looking back at Aesop's fables, which have been recorded back to the 600 BCE, of course, and you even mentioned that they were being translated by Socrates when he was killed by the Athenians. Right. And that goes into more of the foxes and the geese and the wolves. Right. And how did those kind of animals factor in? Yeah, I mean, uh, Aesop, uh, for instance, looked to animals as a, as a way to illustrate human behavior. Um, uh, and again, that's an interesting kind of distancing effect. It's like ascribing to animals human behavior, anthropomorphizing them in a way to kind of safely or uh, effectively talk about human foibles and mishaps and mis misbehaviors. Um, and so that's pretty much what Aesop's fables are all about. They use animals, again, in a different way as a sounding board for human behavior. Um, so, yeah, I've got a lot of Aesop's fables in the, in the book uh, for that reason. They're always popular. And do you have a personal favorite? Um, geez, the, the pickings are so rich. <laughs> I, I, would, I think I would say uh, there's one in there called uh, the, uh, the Donkey and the Little Dog. And it's about uh, a farmer who has a pet, uh, a little dog, and the dog comes in to the house and sits on the master's lap and gets little scraps from the table and is treated specially. Whereas the donkey, you know, a beast of burden, is tied outside the farmhouse and eats hay and doesn't get to come in when it's cold. And the donkey says, I really want to be like the little dog. And decides he's going to make a splash and enters the house and, you know, jumps up on the lap of the master just like the little dog does. And uh, it doesn't go well. <laughs> the donkey's driven out with sticks and oh. banished forever from the house. But it's, it's kind of a, 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 the moral of the, of the story is sort of, you got to know your place. Um, everyone has a place on a farm or in life or anywhere. And, you know, poor donkey, but, you know, it doesn't belong in the house. 
We have, we have donkeys on our farm, <laughs> and, and they would be uh, on our laps in the in the house if they could be, believe me. But you also, they're not coming oh, in. Oh, <laughs> they can't, but we have a dog. <laughs> sure, absolutely. And he, he's in there. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of your work definitely reflects what your day-to-day -day life looks like. Absolutely, yeah. How can it not? Um, keeps life interesting. Sure, and let's <laughs> talk about an animal that you might not have on your farm, octopus. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and, of course, you work with um, Theognis. Is that right? Am I saying that all right? Say again. Theognis. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, and can you tell me what they have to say about octopi? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've seen the that Netflix hit My Octopus Teacher. That uh, I haven't, but I mean, I of course heard about it. Yeah, uh, it, uh, this guy Craig Foster goes down in the South African kelp forest for a whole year every day to visit this octopus and observes her behavior and interacts with her in really quite remarkable ways. The, the uh, filmography is incredible. Um, and uh, one of the things that the octopus does is that uh, it, it can, it'll cling to a rock or it'll go to, into its den and it will change its color to adapt to um, its environment. And Theognis uses this in a poem that I translate in the book uh, as, a, as a, a, a metaphor or analogy for how human beings need to adjust their their, the ways that they interact socially with other human beings the way the octopus does to its environment. Now what's really interesting about this passage, um, you know, it's a poem, it's a simple analogy, but the word that is used, athos, to describe the octopus's environment, athos, is the same word that our word ethics comes from. So the idea that the octopus is uh, interacting appropriately with its environment, just as humans need to interact appropriately with their environments, ethics is a really interesting comparison and, and, uh, and Theognis is inviting us to look to animals as a model or as an example for how we as humans, the human animal, can live. So it's definitely not just stories about about like fun fables about animals, there's always something else. To no, it. there's a there's a good dose of philosophy in here too. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And so you've also translated. We've talked about Homer and and Ovid as well. But you translate, I believe, Porphyry. Yep. And who is he? So Porphyry was a, a philosopher in the Platonist tradition. So he was a Platonist. Um, he was a scholar and a philosopher, a little bit of a kind of a mystic, um, uh, very, I mean, f in antiquity, philosophy was a way of life. It wasn't just an academic, you know, topic of study. Um, so he took it quite seriously. And he wrote um, perhaps what is the first treatise in the Western tradition on vegetarianism. Uh, and he argued that we shouldn't uh, kill uh, animals and we shouldn't eat them. And of course, in the ancient times, uh, there were animal sacrifices were part and parcel of, of religion. So for him to say that was really quite bold for its time. Um, uh, we don't have those anymore for, for the most part, though we do still eat animals, uh, some of us do. Um, so it's, it was a very uh, you know, uh, pointed argument that he makes. And he says that we should, we should treat animals with justice in the same way that we treat human beings uh, justly. They deserve our respect uh, and uh, do no harm should be the principle um, that we, we, we accord with when we interact with them. Absolutely, and you actually have an, an excerpt from him that you've prepared today. Do you mind reading Porphyry and then uh, telling uh, us, reading it in Greek and then telling us what it translates sure. to? Sure, let me read it in English first. Okay, great. Um, and uh, it, it's very, it's, it's just a simple sentence, but I think it sums up his, his whole argument um, in, this, in this treatise. Justice lies in the principle of abstaining and of harmlessness towards everything that does no harm itself. And in Greek that is, Heide dikaiasune en toi affectic toi kai ablabe ketai pantos hotu un tu me balaptontos. So justice lies in the principle of abstaining and of harmlessness toward everything that does no harm itself. And that's just one sentence, and we were speaking about this a little bit before the taping, but a lot of the time, translations will be a little bit headier. There's a lot packed into each sentence. Can you kind of speak to that relationship? Were they speaking like that? Yeah, I, translating from Greek and Latin um, is, is a challenge. I mean, it's what I do for a living, so it's not so much of a challenge for me. I'm, you know, I'm paid to do it, <laughs> it's my job. <laughs> but um, but uh, to make, uh, to make ancient, ancient thought and language accessible to modern audiences, I think is an important part uh, of this job. So um, yeah, it's always about choosing words that, uh, you're translating ideas, you're not really just translating words. Um, and, and I think that that's important to keep in mind. And uh, it's been a kind of a liberating thing for me as I 
try to translate. You know, I'm not just trying to represent each word because it would sound like gibberish. It wouldn't be interesting uh, trying to convey what the author is trying to convey. Sure, um, so there's some creative license there when you're translating? Yeah, I mean, uh, within, within reason, you need, to, you need to, you know, as you know, as a Latin student, <laughs> you need to do justice to the text itself. Um, but, um, but yes, there is some creative license. And I find crea uh, there's a lot of creativity in translation, absolutely. And you were talking about modern day, but even back in the day, Greeks wouldn't necessarily be reading Porphyry. Can you tell me about that kind of relationship between like the more elevated texts? Yeah, so um, you know, writing in antiquity was always much more of a, a performance or like a, a, a formal uh, affair. We kind of take it for granted, but you know, writing was you know on the whole kind of a new thing for them, uh, a newer thing and a special occasion and an expensive process too, right? So um, you had to get it right and you didn't uh, waste words and you were careful about uh, the structures of your sentences. So there was there's a formality to ancient literature, whether it be poetry or prose, that modern newspaper language, you know, doesn't, doesn't convey these days. Um, so that makes it a, a, a challenge for modern readers. But again, all the more reason why it's important for translators to um, uh, develop it and uh, uh, make it palatable. Sure. And of course, Latin and Greek is a huge part of your life, but you also own a farm. You described yourself as a hard scrabble farmer. Can you tell us about, is it Works and Days Farm? Right. Well, Works and Days Farm, the name I stole from Hesiod, uh, 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 the title of one of his poems about farming. And, um, and we have sheep, we have uh, Scottish Highland cattle, we have chickens, who doesn't have chickens? <laughs> um, we have two donkeys named Turks and Caicos. <laughs> um, yeah, and it keeps us uh, busy. My wife has a, a big flower garden uh, and a small business related to that. So yeah, we, um, we, we keep ourselves busy with, with farming. Yeah, I'm glad I have a day job. Absolutely. But, um, but I'm also happy for the, the lifestyle benefits that uh, farming provides. And it sounds like it keeps you close to your work in a lot of ways. It is, and it's funny, those, those two definitely intersect, um, and I'm glad they do. Absolutely, thank you so much for joining us today. It was great to be here, thanks. How to Care About Animals, published by Princeton Press, is available wherever you get your books. Our advice, as always, is to visit with your local librarian to talk about it. That wraps up our program for today. From the crew behind the scenes here at WCAX, I'm Jolie Whitney. Thank you for watching and have a good one.